What's going on guys, Vulcan here, and I am finally level 60 in Diablo Immortal as a 99.99% free to play player. Reason I'm saying that is because I had to spend real money to make a clan in the game. Otherwise, I would have to grind for a few weeks before I'm able to do so. I wasn't gonna do that. So besides that single purchase, I've avoided all of the battle passes, the boosts, the cosmetics, the loot boxes, and everything else the game continuously throws at you. So what is it like playing completely free and how does this Diablo stack up with previous games? So Diablo Immortal is probably one of the most fun Diablo games I've played in terms of combat, in terms of feel, and just immersion, I guess. Now, unfortunately, this is all completely undercut by the microtransactions and the fact that it gives players a constant poke to spend more money in order to progress faster in the game. Now, we're going to get to the cash shop in a little bit, but because that's one of the most talked about things, I did want to focus instead on what I think Diablo Immortal does right before we get into what all Diablo Immortal does wrong. So this game is a fantastic modern step forward for the Diablo franchise in terms of things that are available in the game and the way they present the game. So Diablo 2 and Diablo 3 are both incredible action RPGs. They have deep customization, in-game opportunities, online co-op, and they are truly some of the best action RPGs that you can play today still. I mean, whether you go all the way back to the original Diablo 2 or you play Diablo 2 Resurrected, you're going to get a fantastic experience. Diablo 3 is still one of those games that I recommend to people who are trying to get into the action RPG space because it's so approachable and teaches you basic concepts. Now, Diablo Immortal is not that, not even in the slightest. This game feels less like an ARPG and more like an MMO. Um, think like how Lost Ark is more MMORPG than it is looter ARPG. You don't see fountains of loot coming out of Lost Ark, but you do experience a lot of those MMO-like elements. So Diablo Immortal sends players into a time period shortly after Diablo 2 ends, but before Diablo 3 begins. So the story does feature familiar characters, and you do get to see some interesting development for characters that you see in the third game, as well as some returning enemies from the second game. So overall, the time period and the storyline of Diablo Immortal is good, but it's your typical action RPG storyline. If you care about the lore, you're going to enjoy reading the stories and watching the abundant cinematics. But if you don't, then you can easily skip it all and get right back into the action. And honestly, it's not going to ruin your, your experience either way. Now that brings us to the world of Diablo Immortal. So for a mobile game, the world is pretty sizable compared to other mobile action RPGs on the market today. And of course, they're classic Diablo. You have crypts, you have swamps, demonic realms, crusty old graveyards, all of these you can hack and slash through. They're riddled with enemies. And the game itself does feel closer to Diablo 2 than Diablo 3 in terms of color palette and visuals, which makes me feel pretty good about the art direction they're wanting to take Diablo 4, more kind of gritty and dark and brutal. So this is kind of that... Diablo 3.5, if you will. Now, the zones don't feel overly linear, but you can definitely tell they want to guide players around certain points of interest rather than just creating a more like open theme through each area. But honestly, guys, the real treasure in these areas are the random events, the world bosses, and the hidden layers that open up. So the random events, they range from being like ambushed by six to 12 enemies to escorting an undead carriage. Now, I have not experienced the undead carriage yet, but from what I heard during the beta, it was kind of this like fun little thing that would bring some chaos to the otherwise sort of static world. Now, the first world boss I saw was on Mount Zavane, which is an earlier zone in the game, but you had to interact with an altar and you would summon this undead paladin whose health would scale depending on how many people were around him. So he's entirely possible to solo if you want. It's going to take forever. But as you get more and more people and your damage output rises, so does his health pool. Um, overall, this was a fun little fight. There wasn't really anything in terms of mechanics that I would say were difficult to work through. It was more just you're fighting a health pool than you're fighting an enemy. Now, the cool thing is this sent out a message to everyone in the area that, you, hey, you guys need to run to his spawn and then battle it out to help kind of, you know, overthrow him or whatever. So it was a cool experience, and it was one of the first times that I saw everybody in the zone kind of come together and then work towards a common goal. Now, lastly are the hidden layers. Now, these open up from time to time, and what I've read online is that these are random, but I've also read that they trigger when all of the breakables have been destroyed in the area. So whether or not that's true, 
Um, these things are really cool. I really like them. They're fantastic for earning gems. They're really cool for fighting bosses. Um, they're totally random in terms of location as well. You have a few different places that you can look and it is first come first serve from what I've seen. These are two layer dungeons. They have chests, bosses, and a lot of little events to give you more loot. In short, they're definitely worth doing and they're fun kind of stumbling upon and discovering. Now, to top all of this off, since Diablo Immortal is a fully online game, you're going to see other players out in the world as well. Now, you have a few choices, right? You can party up with them, you can snipe their kills, you can ignore them altogether, and it's really up to you on how involved you want to be in the online aspect of Diablo Immortal in terms of the overworld. See, for me, I really enjoyed seeing Diablo make this leap. Right now, the action RPG king is Path of Exile. And that game does have a shared world feature where you can see other players and hubs, but not out in the overworld. Diablo needed to make some adjustments to bring online to the franchise outside of just online co-op. And I think it did, it did it in a great way, in my opinion. I feel like the kind of full on online aspect is the natural progression of where Diablo needs to go. And I know some purists and some folks who really love classic Diablo aren't going to see it that way, but for somebody who really loves MMOs, really loves action RPGs. This was a great blend between those two. And I think this is one of the things that Diablo Immortal did right. So that's it for world and zones, but I did want to talk about classes and loot because I am very torn on how they did this. So first of all, the loot in Immortal is classic Diablo. You have your rainbow of rarities. You have your large assortment of pieces you can equip. However, they didn't do anything exciting to build on this very tried and true formula. I mean, if you really enjoy Diablo's loot system, you're going to understand and probably enjoy this one. But if you're expecting an improvement, you're going to be very disappointed in both quality and quantity because the game really just doesn't have enough worthwhile loot to chase after, in my opinion. Each armor slot has a handful of legendary pieces to chase after. Each one of those is going to augment one skill. So this already creates a bottleneck that if you don't like a certain skill, then that legendary immediately loses value to you anyway. So you're going to take a limited pool and reduce it even further. And then you have gear sets, which I've only found two so far. So I heard there's a handful in the game. Um, but the two I have seen, I've seen, like, I mean, they seem useful enough, but nothing to get like overly excited over. Things like stacking increased attack speed and then increasing the duration of loss of control skills, which might be useful for PvP. But overall, I mean, this is just another instance where the loot in the game isn't exciting enough to be the incentive to keep playing for me. And that's where legendary gems come into play. Um, we'll talk about that in the cash shop section. But this is truly where a lot of your power is derived and where the kind of loot chase um, exists, unfortunately, right? Especially in an action RPG. Now, the other thing I want to touch on is the actual classes and their skills. So just to get this out of the way, I miss my Witch Doctor. I really wish they had added that one into uh, Diablo Immortal. I absolutely love that class and everything that goes with it. Sh you know, Shaman for life. So Witch Doctor is the um, kind of natural jump for me. Um, so I went with a Crusader. I love Paladins. Crusader's kind of that natural move there. So anyway, Crusader it is. So... The class and skill development in Diablo Immortal is incredibly shallow. I feel like it took a step back compared to other Diablo games or other action RPGs on the market. So you can increase your passive stats and you can add passive stats, but you don't have a rune system like in Diablo 3. You don't have a skill tree like in Diablo 2. You don't even have any way to augment your skills other than legendaries and gear sets from what I've seen so far as a Paragon 4 level 60. So what you truly see is truly what you get. And I feel like this was a huge missed opportunity by Blizzard. I mean, you have the resources, the creativity, and the lore to really draw some cool ways for players to alter their skills. And that way you can give them more options because right now it's literally just equip and forget for each situation. And that's about it. And you combine that with the very limited legendary pool you already have and you truly don't really have a lot of options when it comes to building your character or trying something different. If you want to run a, um, you know, like a horse build for Crusader, you have the things that you can equip and that's it. You can't really augment it too much from there. If you want to try, you know, a Conjuration of Light build for a Crusader, it's the same thing. And I see this kind of propagated throughout all of the different classes. So that's one thing that I think 
Diablo Immortal really kind of falls short um, in. So let's take Torchlight Infinite, for example. I'm going to compare mobile game to mobile game right now. So Torchlight Infinite, for those of you who don't know, is an upcoming mobile PC console game, right? So they're going to be multi-platform, similar to what Diablo Immortal is doing. Now, Torchlight Infinite is the next proper entry into the Torchlight franchise. Um, Torchlight 3 was an absolute abomination, and it really just fell short on every single category, which was very unfortunate. Um, I really wish they would have kept it as Torchlight Frontiers. That way we wouldn't have this whole Torchlight 3 debacle. Anyway, Torchlight Infinite is coming soon. It's coming this year. Now, this game is going to be amazing for build variety and progression. So what they did was they took the gem system from PoE, uh, Path of Exile, and they made it more approachable and easy to understand. So you have a base skill and then you can equip support gems to augment the skill. That way that skill has more projectiles. You can change the element. You can cause a chain reaction, apply on hit or on death or on crit effects. You name it, it's there. So they truly said Path of Exile has a fantastic system. Let's lift it and shift it. We're going to put it into Torchlight Infinite. We're going to completely detach it from gear. We're going to make it its own standalone system. That way people can just purchase the support gems they want, purchase the basic skills they want using in-game currency or unlocks. So I'm not talking real money here. And equip it to your character. And next thing you know, you have all of these ways you can build your character. Not every single time witness is going to be like every other time witness. Not every berserker is going to fall into the same category or playstyles every berserker. I mean, I saw a build the other day where a berserker was using two wands and was doing this whole kind of frost cleave type of thing. And another berserker was whirlwinding. Another one was leap smashing. Another one was using a um, ax throw. So there's all sorts of different ways you can augment your character and really find a build that fits you and gives you things to tinker with. So between these two, Diablo Immortal is much closer to an MMO, while Torchlight Infinite is much closer and is an action RPG in terms of the traditional sense of Diablo, Grim Dawn, uh, Titan Quest, all of those ones that we really, really like. So anyway, back to Immortal. Um, more on Torchlight later. I have a lot of videos planned for that one. But back to Immortal. So basically, if you're looking for lots of build variety, Immortal's not going to deliver, um, in my opinion feel free to kind of prove me wrong if you've unlocked something different that I haven't unlocked yet or if there's something else that I haven't seen. Um, but for now, what I've experienced is just not going to deliver. So the next thing I want to kind of give kudos to uh, Diablo Immortal for is their codex. And I know a lot of people are going to be kind of split on this one. So I've always been someone who enjoys task lists and clearing those off daily in video games. I just, I don't know what it is. I just love to have like, hey, here's some stuff I can knock out. I know it's going to give me progression. Um, dailies, you know, when dailies first were introduced in World of Warcraft, I loved them. I thought they were a fantastic addition. Real life's another story. Not a big fan of task lists in real life, but in games, give me a checklist. I love it. So the Codex, for those of you who don't know, is a um, sort of system in the game. It has a bunch of activities, quests, achievements, and really kind of things to help give you an idea of what to do in the game whether that's dungeons, group activities, farming enemies for essence, etc. This was really nice. And I really enjoy having some guides since during the week, I don't have a ton of time at night to play. Uh, most of my day is filled up with my full-time job and then family time and then, you know, chores, doing things around the house. And then I take a couple hours at night to work on YouTube stuff or game or whatever. So this lets me make the most out of those few hours I have so I can make sure that I progress and keep up with the full timers. So having a codex and a checklist is sort of my way to make sure I keep up with everybody. Now, the codex is also one of the primary methods for gaming, gaining experience and leveling up by completing objectives. And then you can earn something called battle points, which rank up your battle pass and give you hundreds of thousands of experience. This is absolutely crucial um, for the gameplay loop. We're going to cover more on this later, but just know the codex is sort of your primary method um, for breaking through some level restrictions. So lastly, I want to talk about group content as a free to play player you need to get comfortable doing content with strangers. Uh, if you have friends that want to play with you, fantastic. If not, you need to be okay with matchmaking, getting put into parties with strangers, because this is going to help maximize your time with the game. Being in a party will give you experience boosts, as well as increased chances at getting gems, which you need to improve your gear, and it makes things go much, much, much faster. So be sure to find a party whenever you possibly can. Um, it just, honestly, it helps. It is such a game changer 
um, than if you do solo versus party stuff. And you, the thing is, you have lots of things to do with other people. You have story dungeons, you have battlegrounds, raids, vault raids, questing. So this plays right back into the aspect that Diablo Immortal is truly an online game with tons of incentive to play with others. Okay, so those are all of the things that I enjoyed about Diablo Immortal. So now I want to talk about my experience as a free-to-play player and the amount of hurdles that you'll have to deal with on a daily basis if you decide to go down this path. But before I get into this, I know there are some arguments out there around free players and expecting the game to hand everything to them. I completely get that. If you want to spend money, by all means, you are a grown adult, you have financial freedom. That's one of the perks of being an adult and having a job. Now, as a free player, I also have the freedom to bring up pain points and provide feedback to Blizzard to make adjustments. So, yin yang. So let's go ahead and let's get into this whole thing. So first, I want to talk about clans because this was kind of the first shock that I had playing Diablo Immortal. So in this game, you can join with clans and then you can eventually convert them into what's known as a dark clan. And these are called shadows. Um, they're crucial for gameplay. They provide you with a lot of different activities. They unlock a big portion of the game in terms of how you can spend your time, how you can progress, all of these things. The clan process is completely awful. It is one of the most just terrible processes for clans I've ever seen in my, my, my long history of games. So to start, you create a clan for 3000 platinum, which you can either grind out over a couple weeks, or you can spend $10 to purchase enough orbs from the cash shop to create a clan. Already off to a bad start. This is where my $10 purchase came into play to create a clan for my Discord community so we could all play together. And it was just, honestly, I was, I was shocked. I was like, I have to spend money to make a clan, whatever. Second, once all of your members in your clan reach level 43 and complete the entry quest to join the shadows, you can convert to a dark clan and you can start experiencing new activities and earning marks. Um, that way you can compete against other clans on the leaderboard. You can do all sorts of cool stuff. Then the top 10 clans get bonus rewards and eventually earn their spot as immortals. If I understand this whole process correctly, that's sort of how that works. So the entry quest. The entry quest to the shadows is you get started by joining a lottery. And this is like a lottery in real life. This will randomly select winners. And if you win, you can continue your quest to join the shadows by completing a series of trials. Once completed, you're going to earn a signet, which can then be used as a token, so a consumable token, to join a shadow clan or to convert your existing one. Now, like I said, this is by far the worst process I've ever experienced. First, you're requiring players to reach level 43, which whatever, I get, level requirement. But then you're requiring players to join a random lottery to then earn a consumable token to then spend on joining a clan. And if you're the clan leader and you want to recruit people, people either have to have a signet to join or you can give them one of yours, which you need to go enter the lottery and you have to grind out so then they can join. I have never seen so many hoops to join a clan in my life. This whole process was painful. I really don't know what Blizzard was thinking here. And like I said, this was like the first thing that I ran into where I was like, okay, first I have to spend money. And now on top of this, I have all of these random things that I have to do just to get a group of people together outside of a war band. Okay. You have war bands. Those are eight players. You can play with your friends, all of that fun stuff, but to actually create a clan was something that's something else man so that was the whole process and it was not great so let's go ahead and let's shift gears a little bit and let's move into the gameplay loop in the cash shop so in diablo immortal here is a high overview and a very loose overview of the gameplay loop you can expect from start to finish so you want to do your quest until you reach a leveling roadblock this first one is at 35. at this point you need to do other things to earn experience so first you want to open up your codex and then start doing activities to earn battle pass points. These are going to give you huge amounts of experience. So whenever you level up your battle pass, you're going to get, I'm talking hundreds of thousands of experience, um, which will basically give you an instant level. And these codex activities are typically grindy. They're going to require you to repeat content multiple times to get the most, most out of each activity. So there's just, there's a lot, right? It's, it's a very much a busy work list. Um, now going into this, you're going to start earning these battle points, um, naturally, just as you play through the campaign, you know, kill a hundred monsters, you're going to do that obviously, 
Um, do not claim these until you reach the leveling roadblock. Reason being is the level up. So like the battle pass level ups are going to be worth more the higher level you are versus um, the lower. So for instance, if you use all of your battle pass levels, um, rank ups or whatever at level 10, then you're gonna earn drastically less experience than you would get at level 35 when you actually need it to kind of break through your leveling block. So just quick tip there. So once you've exhausted all of your codex entries or you get bored, you can pick up bounties. These can be picked up four at a time with a daily maximum of eight. Now, if you skip some days, you can come back and it will allow you to pick up um, the amount of bounties that you missed. So if you miss two days, you can do 16, that type of thing. Now, these are going to give loot, gold, and a medium amount of experience. Um, I highly recommend doing them because they're going to help. So once you've completed all of your bounties, you need to keep up with your Elder Rifts. Now these are similar to Greater Rifts from Diablo 3. If you have Legendary or Rare Crests, which are earned through questing, or um, you're given one Legendary Quest, or Legendary Crest through your questing, but then you're also able to purchase a Legendary Crest from the Hilt Vendor once per month, which is another thing we'll talk about. So use any crests that you have because these are going to give you extra rewards. Legendary crests are harder to come by for free players, so you definitely want to take advantage of those when you can. Otherwise, you want to run Elder Rifts to earn Fading Embers. Then you can use this special currency to purchase runes, which you can then use at the Jeweler to trade for Legendary Gems. Legendary Gems are the benchmark for endgame power. So you do have a cap of 320 uh, Fading Embers per week, so feel free to spread these out over multiple days or just bang them all out at one time. It's really up to you. You get roughly eight, um, I believe, per run. So it's going to take a long time if you don't have any extra crests. So keep that in mind, plan accordingly. So after your Elder Rifts, you want to make sure to complete a few Challenge Rifts. You don't want to do as many as you possibly can because there will be Codex, codex activities that asks you to do them. And you don't want to be stuck because a rift's too hard and you have to skip that entry because then you're skipping experience. So there's some strategy to this. Now, all while you're doing this, you should be collecting Monstrous Essence. These are a random drop from creatures. It's about a 10% drop. Um, you collect 10 of these and you can turn them in. You'll earn gear and experience. You can do these three times a day. They give you 40 battle points per turn in, so 120 total per day. And it's something that is very worthwhile. So just grinding mobs. Um, now, once you've completed all of that, you do have a few optional things to do. So once a week, you can complete the Heliquary, which is basically a raid for loot and gold. It's a raid boss. It's not like a traditional raid. You go in, you kill the boss, you leave. Um, you need to be gear score or sorry, combat rating 485 to do this. So make sure to check that out. And then from a daily perspective, you need to complete contracts for your clan and participate in timed events. Things like Raid the Vault, Battlegrounds, Path of Blood. All of these give experience and materials. Then you want to make sure to visit the blacksmith to upgrade your gear and then visit the jeweler to upgrade gems and craft those legendary gems we talked about. Now, after you've done all of this, you should be well past the level requirement to start questing again. Do this until you reach the next roadblock or until reset the next day and then rinse and repeat. So that is the gameplay loop almost per day that you need to go through in order to fully enjoy and take advantage of Diablo Immortal. Now, so for someone leveling, this is kind of the overall process. It's very grindy. There are tons of things to do um, to keep you busy. But let's talk about the things that you can cut out by just dropping some cash. So if you buy the battle pass in the game, you're going to earn lots of extra materials, legendary crests, gems, legendary, legendary gems, and then even more, right? They're going to very much make it worth your time to spend that $5 a month. Then when it comes to the greatest separation of power, in my opinion, the boon of plenty is that. This is $10 per month, and it gives players seven legendary crests, two legendary gems, 30 rare crests, and 30 normal gems over a one month period. So seven legendary crests, you might get two the first week, and then um, they spread them out over the next couple weeks. Who knows? Maybe you get all seven at once. I'm not sure I didn't buy it. So to put this whole thing in perspective though, because it doesn't seem like a lot, like, okay, $10, I get seven legendary crests, who cares? To put this in perspective, as a free to play player, Here's what you would need to do to get seven legendary crests. One, you would need to purchase a legendary crest 
once per month from the hilt vendor for seven months. You would need to reach rank 20 on the battle pass for seven months, assuming that the legendary crest reward stays the same for each battle pass per month. Um, we don't know if that's going to move or whatever, but right now let's just pretend that it stays the same. And then number three, become a top 10 guild seven times. So there are some other hidden purchases. I believe immortals would be able to purchase legendary crests. If you become a immortal guild, which I think is like the top three on the server or something like that. Um, and then there's also a couple battleground rewards, um, I believe, but all in all, right. It's going to take you roughly seven months to earn the exact same amount of legendary crests that it would then take you to just spend $10. So this is just insane. It's insane. It's just an insane amount of time, luck, and grind in order to earn the same amount of crest that you would get in one month for 10 bucks. I mean, it's an unreal comparison, and it just shows how many limitations they place on free-to-play players in order to get you to spend money in the cash shop. So the Legendary Gems also, because I know people are going to ask, that's going to save you about 10 hours worth of grinding as well. It takes five hours to get seven runes, which then you can take and trade in for one one-star gem. Because these are two-star gems, um, it might take you even longer. So to keep this whole train moving, let's talk about being a Battle Pass owner. So if you decide to purchase the Battle Pass for $5 a month, not the Empowered or Collector's Battle Pass or whatever it's called, um, just the regular good old fashioned battle pass, you're going to get access to special codex entries that'll give you more experience and battle pass points. This allows you to earn 40 more po points per day um, or whenever the codex refreshes, which will make your leveling experience a little bit shorter. Honestly, it's not a huge thing, but it's just something every time you open the codex and you look at your quest window, you'll see empowered battle pass users only um, on that quest. So that's going to be something that's going to be staring you in your face 24 seven. Now, you also have something known as the Prodigy's Path, which is another $20 purchase. So right now, if you were to buy all of these things, you're looking at about $35 a month. So the $20 purchase for Prodigy's Path, this is going to give you even more legendary crests each time you reach a certain level milestone on your character. Now, you're also going to get some Scoria, which can be used to upgrade your Heliquary to unlock more passive bonuses. So again, paying for these things is going to give you more power. Now, a lot of you might be asking, who cares about legendary crests? Like what, what are these? Especially if you've never played the game. So a legendary crest versus a, a rare crest. So a rare crest will give you a chance at extra gear and a chance at um, more fading embers per run in Elder Rift. So it just gives you more of what you're already getting. Legendary crests guarantee that a legendary gem will drop from that Elder Rift. So if you go and run it, you know you're going to get a gem, whether it's a rank one gem or a rank five gem, which are the rarest. Um, you know you're going to get one. These can either be used by you or you can take these and you can crush them down and use them to upgrade your existing gems. So I could do seven runs back to back to back and get seven gems. And at that point, I would be able to upgrade or equip my character. Um, alternatively, as a free player, in order to get seven legendary gems, that's about 35 hours worth of grinding. And then at that point, I would be able to do the exact same thing. So it's like an hour versus 35 hours in terms of time commitment. So just kind of put that in perspective. Now, besides these things that I've listed, there are other tons of other stuff in the cash shop. There are troves, there are caches. And all of these things are going to provide you with extra crests, extra eternal orbs, which can then be used to purchase things, including crests. You have cosmetics, you have legendary gems, and these all range from $2 to $50. Now, I'm not going to lie. The one that really pissed me off was when I completed my first Hell 1 dungeon. So I hit 60. I did a dungeon on Hell 1 difficulty. Once I completed it, it popped up and said, you've unlocked a Hell 1 cache. And I was like, Awesome. I was expecting a reward for the completion. Like, hey, man, this is your first time doing it. Here you go. Boom. Extra chest. You're going to love it. Instead, it was a new $50 bundle that unlocked in the store, a one time purchase bundle. And this just really irritated me because it's like I go through and I hit this uh, Hell One dungeon. Complete is easy, obviously. It wasn't anything like hard or difficult. Um, but I go through and complete it and it pops up. And it's like, hey, here's this brand new thing. And the thing that really irritated me was 
they have the same animation and look as when you unlock a new feature in the game. So like, oh, hey, you've unlocked gems or you've unlocked crafting. Like it has a, a similar look and feel. It did the exact same thing for this bundle, which made it kind of grandiose and like over the top, like, oh man, this is something brand new that I can take advantage of. No, it was just another instance of asking the customer to spend more money to enhance their experience. It was like 50 bucks for 20 crests, a bunch of eternal orbs, I think some scoria. So there was a lot of stuff packed into this that, I mean, yeah, it was probably a great deal. Um, but at the same time, it just, oh my gosh, it just drove me nuts. I don't know what it was about that, but it just seemed very, very petty and very um, just a microcosm of everything in this game. So the last thing I want to make clear, guys, because... I spent the last like 10 minutes talking about the cash shop and the gameplay loop and um, how just intrusive and um, I don't want to say the term empowering, but how spending money in the cash shop will empower your experience in terms of cutting the grind down, giving you instant access to, to power and ways to upgrade your character and really allowing you to skip a lot of the grind. Like that is something that's there. Now I've seen articles, I've seen reports of like, hey, it's gonna take $110,000 to be fully upgraded or whatever. And maybe, I mean, if you're wanting to get like to be the top 0.001%, then sure, like you're probably gonna have to spend a ton of money. But um, just the fact that these things are there and Diablo took such a, a left turn from Diablo 3 and Diablo 2 and even Diablo 2 Resurrected, right? Um, those are the last games in the franchise. And suddenly we have Diablo Immortal that just went all in and said, Hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to really separate the haves and the have nots. And I don't, I don't know. It just, to me, it rubbed me the wrong way. And this game was positioned to be such a cool experience and such a fun thing to just spend hours upon hours in. And it just was completely deflated by the cash shop. And I just don't know. I understand NetEase and their influence and all of that stuff. But to me, Blizzard still owns a lot of this. Obviously they still own the IP. So it kind of comes with that notion of truly how much did NetEase have to push them to add all of these things in there? Or was this already something that Blizzard was planning and expecting and just didn't, didn't push back? So anyway, before I wrap all this up, I did want to make one thing abundantly clear. Like I said, I've been talking about the cash shop forever. Um, this game can be played 100% free. You get to experience the story. You get to have fun in early difficulties. You can even make some nice leaderboard pushes. But as you get towards end game, the gap between those who pay and those who don't will continue to grow. The time commitment is going to be vastly different between those two types of players. So if you're somebody who just wants to see the story and all that, you're going to have a good time. You don't have to spend a dime. You can just play through it. So all in all, I am having fun with Diablo Immortal. I am. The combat, the story, the world, the online aspect, being able to pick the game up and play for a bit, like if I'm waiting in line at the store or if I'm on the couch at home, has been a really nice change of pace. I like the flexibility of being able to play on the go or being able to play on my PC. I really, really like that. And if it wasn't for the very obvious presence of the cash shop, I'd say this is probably one of the better Diablo games I've played. So hopefully Diablo Immortal will kind of sacrifice itself and suffice as the cash cow for blizzard so when that diablo 4 comes out they're gonna leave all of this awful practice and awful stuff behind and we can have a proper continuation of the diablo franchise so guys this was an incredibly long long video it was much much longer than i actually wanted it to be i was aiming for like 18 to 20 minutes but I kind of just got to talking and just putting everything out there about my experience so far um, with diablo immortal and sort of having that that dialogue with everybody but anyway i'm curious what you all think of diablo immortal i have an idea but i'm curious what everyone has thought so far and now that we've been able to get our hands on it on both pc and mobile what do you guys think let me know in the comment section below but as always thank you so much for watching this has been vulcan and i will talk to you guys next time